from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Her neighborhood, Ms. Alexander lives just on the other side of the Capitol. Um, she'll be talking today uh, not only uh, about her new book, which is called Parallel Worlds, The Remarkable Gibbs Hunts and the Enduring Insignificance of Melanin, but also uh, something about, about now, about, about the district that she's called home for a long time, about the extended family that she's a part of that's had such influence in the district, in the culture, in the nation, and also of note, her daughter who graced another pavilion earlier this morning was seen just uh, in front of that, in that white building over there as Barack Obama's inaugural poet. Also uh, interviewed in Linnea Parker, uh, Linnea O'Neill Parker's piece this morning. So without hesitation, I, uh, I want to welcome Adele Logan Alexander. I thank you all so much for coming. This is the, I've, uh, I've been, been writing history for a long time, studying history, teaching history, writing history for a long time. And you know, we sometimes as, um, as academic historians feel as if we sort of labor in caves and uh, very few people outside the academic world knows what we're about, knows what we're, what we're writing about. And, uh, and then, you know, you, you, talk to, you talk to groups of 12 people. <laughs> and uh, and they're enth 12 enthusiastic people. But then when, you, when we, we come across something like this incredible uh, National Book Festival and the support from the Library of Congress, created by the Library of Congress, supported by the Washington Post and my introducer, and, and then, of course, I was so thrilled, my daughter and I were, were so thrilled uh, when Lane's piece came out in the Washington Post and everybody's been coming up to me, you know, here I am, obscure historian. Everybody comes up to me and says, I just saw your picture, I just read about you and your, your daughter and so on. And, uh, and also it is so absolutely unique and wonderful that my daughter and I are, have the privilege of appearing here together at, um, at the National Book Festival. And of course, she had a poem that kind of made her famous that was heard by two billion, with a B, people around the, uh, around the world. So I come here standing before you most humbly in appreciation and uh, I'm going to talk not for very long, and I'll, I'll talk for, they didn't tell me until just now that I was also going to talk about my family and our role in the District of Columbia. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about my book, and maybe we can get to the other stuff in, in questions, because I'd love to have some, uh, some give and take with you and, and what, you, what you are interested in or you might be interested in with this particular book and about uh, African-American history and women's history and uh, whatever else you're, you're thinking about. So, so let me just talk to you uh, about 10 minutes about this, uh, about this book. I have to put this down because the space under here won't accommodate. Okay, uh, so here we go, okay. And one of the things that is particularly um, enjoyable about writing, uh, about talking about this particular uh, book, which is called Parallel Worlds, The Remarkable Gibbs Hunts and the Enduring Insignificance of Melanin, is that uh, different readers, different audiences um, suggest different approaches. You know, different audiences come to it with, with different interests. And there's plenty of meat here uh, in the book to approach it from a variety of different directions. At George Washington University, where I have been teaching f since 1994, um, they asked me last winter to fit this in with, uh, with their Black History Month theme about um, the new Negro in Washington, D.C. in the 1920s. And of course, I did that. Uh, I talked about black women's issues and black women's political activism at the Women's National Democratic Club. So, um, 
I did that there. Then just recently at the DC Historical Society, I joined a, uh, a panel where we talked about how things have changed and things have not changed in terms of uh, African Americans and, uh, and women's influence in foreign relations. And foreign relations is a very important part of this, uh, this book. But the Library of Congress, when I, when I spoke there last winter, advertised this as being a, about a remarkable mixed race family. Um, so this gives me an opportunity to talk about those aspects of, of parallel worlds. Uh, given the great variety um, and accelerated discussions and debates that we've had in the last few years about uh, so-called mixed race people in the United States, most obviously, certainly, our, uh, our, our president. Plus uh, the fact that relatively recently, as of the 2000 census, and of course we've just taken another census, but as of the 2000 uh, sentence, uh, census, we could talk about, uh, about so-called mixed races and claim ourselves as having all kinds of, uh, of, of different um, racial heritage. So, so that's been, I don't know whether any of you uh, in fact saw the, um, the Henry Louis Gates uh, series on, uh, on television called Faces of America. And one of the things that he is emphasizing in, um, in, in that is how, uh, how many interrelationships we, we have racially, culturally, and so on. Um, just as a very amusing aside, uh, Stephen Colbert, who interviewed my daughter after she was um, the inaugural poet, um, and he is a neighbor of my son in Montclair, New Jersey, and they have been working on ellipticals together, and so they've known each other for some time. And uh, it turns out from Skip Gates's research that in fact, we are cousins. And of course, in his own dry way, Stephen Ke Colbert says, no, 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 I am the whitest man in America. <laughs> but um, it, 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 it did introduce us to all kinds of, uh, of, of different things. So uh, I'm going to inform you a little bit, I hope, and challenge you to think about some of these questions as, as I talk. Um, and one of the things that I do know, and that most of us in this room who identify ourselves as African Americans know too, at least uh, this is true for those of us who are, shall we say, over 50, that regardless of our physical features, uh, skin color, hair texture, all of those things. We always thought of ourselves, in my childhood, the word, of course, was Negroes. Uh, more recently, we became blacks, then we became African Americans. We didn't think of, we older generation, didn't think of ourselves as being of mixed race. There was no question about that. And this was a matter that was shaped by a lot of things. It was shaped by custom, it was shaped by, uh, by law, and it was also very much shaped by, um, uh, by pride in, uh, in, racial, uh, in racial accomplishments. Uh, that's not to say, of course, that we didn't know pretty much for sure that in our families several generations back, there was indeed a complex uh, racial history. Someplace several generations back or more, uh, there often were admixtures of white blood, and I use that word blood, which we all know is a metaphor. It doesn't really um, uh, mean it. I always see quotation marks whenever I say blood in that context. And, uh, con and we also, many of us, had uh, Native American so-called blood as, as, as well. We also knew and know that in most cases this, uh, this whiteness had intruded on our African-ness through white male progenitors, and it was uh, not always something that came uh, consensually. Uh, I recently heard a lecture at uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, in which a grantee has developed uh, a massive database of the Atlantic slave trade over almost 400 years. And one of the statistics gleaned from that, and this is totally amazing to me who, you know, I've done history for more than 20 years, uh, that until the mid-1800s, the ratio of black women, B 
being brought to this country, in other words, African women, to white women, the women who came here voluntarily, that that ratio was nine to one. Uh, amazing. So obviously what we know from, from this is that most of the European men who crossed the Atlantic uh, did not come with their, with, with their wives. So um, some but few Native American women were available to them. Uh, so in many cases, of course, their sexual partners were African slaves. Um, the other interesting and unique thing that happened in the new United States in the 1800s was that there was a virtual reversal of the old tradition that was so prevalent in, in English common law, which determined that the condition, the legal condition of a child followed the condition of the mother. Now that meant that when we turned that concept upside down, the child of a slave woman uh, was also therefore enslaved in perpetuity. Uh, that determination did a lot of things. It uh, both saved white men from having any moral or financial responsibility for their offspring, and it also ensured an ever-growing, ever-sufficient enslaved population for a new country that grounded its economy and uh, much of its wealth in slave labor, especially that was true after 1807 when the international slave trade was banned. In other words, you couldn't bring any more uh, enslaved Africans into the country. So that uh, dramatically curtailed the availability, the supposedly limitless supply of those, uh, of those people. Another factor soon crept into this complex equation, and that was, again, something that's unique in the United States, uh, sort of a binary definition of race itself. In other words, in the United States, anybody who is not certifiably, quote, white, all white, so to speak, uh, anyone with any so-called trace of Negro blood, uh, was designated both in law and in practice to be a, uh, a Negro. So this is very different from the situation even in the rest of the Western Hemisphere where various degrees of so-called Negro-ness uh, gave people varying amounts of privilege, uh, varying amounts of protections under the uh, law. Sometimes that uh, included uh, getting your, your freedom. So I tell you this to introduce some of the specific circumstances in which the two intertwined families, uh, the Gibbs and the Hunts, uh, whom I write about in Parallel Worlds, found themselves in the 19th century, which is when my story takes place. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit more about the, uh, the book and how these people that I write about they're my main protagonists are Ida Gibbs Hunt and William Henry Hunt, how they came to be part of these mixed race families. Both of these are fascinating people to whom I was drawn in the first place because I love biography. I love family history. I have, uh, I have written two family history books uh, before this one. Uh, my first one was Ambiguous Lives and my second one was the American saga, um, Homelands and Waterways, the American saga of the Bond family. Um, I saw in their marriage, this marriage of Ida and, and William, uh, a remarkable balance of power, balance of gender uh, power. Uh, that wasn't singular in their uh, era, but certainly it's hard to document, and certainly that was an era when women, for the most part, played very subservient roles to, uh, to men. I also wanted, of course, to tell a good story uh, because what I love to do with, with history is the story part of it and telling good stories because that's what attracts me and I think that's what attracts a lot of, uh, a lot of you as, as well. Uh, William Henry Hunt uh, actually became the first African American to have a full career with the State Department. And uh, thus he lived around the world for 35 years, most of it with his wife. 
Uh, Ida also was a significant intellectual. She was a major organizer of W.E.B. Du Bois's Pan-African Congresses in Europe in the 1920s. So there was plenty of heft to both of their uh, lives. They these people also provided me with a lot of documentary evidence to help in recreating their stories. Ida's father, Mifflin Gibbs, wrote and published an autobiography in 1902. She herself published extensively, and she left scads of personal uh, letters, as did her sister and her brother-in-law. Now, William Hunt uh, wrote, but he didn't manage to get it published, a memoir of his own, as well as a number of articles, and he too left a plethora of both uh, personal and professional correspondence. William, and uh, I'll call him Billy now because he becomes Billy in early in my narrative, he was born into slavery in 1863 in rural Tennessee. Uh, he apparently never felt the, na the need to say specifically a white man was my father, uh, but he, he knew from family and friends that his father did live in the nearby so-called big house, that being, of course, the, uh, the phrase that was always used for the master's house in the antebellum South. Um, and as I write about Billy's uh, account of his paternity, he says, quote, stories like, like these offer anecdotal, though credible, confirmation uh, that by wielding their physical, sexual, economic, and emotional powers, such white men have significantly lightened so-called black America's collective complexion, while with apparent indifference, they contributed to widespread illegitimacy in that community. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the things that we talk about all, all the time now, and appropriately so, is illegitimacy in the, uh, in the black community. But um, one of my arguments in this is to say that this was first an imposed illegitimacy that came out of the traditions of, of slavery. Uh, his mother, Billy's mother, I determ determined, belonged to a slave-owning widower whose name was William H. Hunt. She gave her oldest son his name, uh, with whom she had six children. I judge from that account, combined with census documentation of both Billy and his mother, and from Billy's appearance, he was quite light-skinned, light hair, curl uh, light eyes, curly hair, uh, that to use our metaphor again, he probably had considerably more so-called white blood than so-called black blood. Uh, nonetheless, as I also s explained before, for purposes of law and in practice, he was in fact designated a Negro, and he never tried to uh, uh, seriously circumvent that identification, although he could have. Um, another question, arises because uh, I think he perhaps may have had Native American ancestors. When he was a consul in France in the 1920s, uh, there was an article written in a French newspaper that said he was a Peau Rouge, uh, that uh, common but uh, ugly designation of a redskin. Uh, perhaps Billy Hunt heard that, that rumor and repeated it in his host country, but anyway, it became common uh, news in, in France. Uh, so the French, it seemed, in the 1920s really wanted to differentiate him and his wife, Ida, from the truly black colonial people, uh, colonial Africans, whom they knew something about and whom they considered uh, very primitive. They didn't consider, you know, they thought that Billy Hunt was a sophisticated man. He was an American. He was educated and, and so forth. Um, Ida Alexander Gibbs came from another such mixed race family, and her story, as I documented, is perhaps even more intriguing, although we do hear these stories from time to time. Uh, family lore, combined with other anecdotal and census records, reveals a lineage um, that's very interesting on her maternal side. Uh, I argue that Ida's maternal grandfather was a man named Richard Mentor Johnson. Um, you probably don't know that name. I didn't know it before I undertook this uh, endeavor, and I should know such things because I'm supposed to be a historian. Uh, but he was very well known in, in his time because from 1837 to 1841, he was vice president 
of the United States, Martin Van Buren is vice, vice president. Uh, before that period, during that period, Johnson was a Kentucky slave owner. He had been a senator. He officially remained a bachelor throughout his life. Uh, there's a lot of documentation, a lot of speculation about his uh, relationships, especially with a woman named Julia Chin, with whom he had two daughters, whom he acknowledged and supported. Um, but according to many accounts, Julia Chin was not the only slave woman with whom he had sexual relations. And sometimes he kept more than one mistress of color at the same time. Several biographies suggest that he also had liaisons with, and prepare yourselves for this, this one sort of shocked me, with Julia's two nieces. Uh, one was named Patience Chin, and the other was named Lucy Chin Alexander, Lucy being the mother of my protagonist, Ida Gibbs. Um, one such story, which I quote in my book, suggests that uh, Lucy had, quote, about the complexion of Shakespeare's swarthy Othello. Uh, who knows what the swarthy Othello's complexion was like. But in any case, she at least had one child by that white man, Maria, who was um, Ida's mother. Um, most evidence suggests that it was Richard Mentor Johnson, vice president, who was her, her father. Um, I think that these stories are true, and they also lead me to suspect that the Chin family had Native American forebears as well. Uh, several accounts suggest that Maria ran away from R.M. Johnson with the assistance of a Choctaw Indian man. Um, so descriptions of the women in the family also say that they were copper skinned and they had straight black hair and so on. So, uh, so I think that they probably also had uh, Native American blood as well. My book recounts the early life of Ida's father, Mifflin Gibbs, but his experiences, while equally remarkable, do not include any such accounts of white men who used or misused their slave women and, can and fathered their children. So those are some of the stories about uh, Ida Gibbs and William Hunt's ancestries that I recount in Parallel World, which leads to the designation of them in today's lexicon as, um, as being so-called mixed race family. Uh, now let's fast forward a little to the early 20th century. Billy Hunt first followed his very successful father-in-law to uh, the consulate in colonial Madagascar in 1898. And then he went on, after 10 years in Madagascar, he went on to 20 years in, in France. Then he was sent to uh, Guadeloupe. And in 1929, he found himself in the mid-Atlantic Portuguese Azores, uh, a locale that he found to be quite idyllic. And at that time, and here we get into some of the personal stories that are intertwined. He had correspondence with a young Negro woman named Caroline Bond Day, whose mother was a close friend of Billy's wife, Ida. Caroline wanted a, a, a photograph of Consul Hunt to add to the collection that she was pulling together at Harvard University for her pending master's degree in anthropology. When her work was complete, um, she became the first self-identified Negro anywhere in the country to earn a graduate degree in that field. In 1932, Harvard published her thesis under the title, A Study of Some Negro White Families in the United States. The work seems a bit primitive by uh, today's standards of anthropology, but it was far and away the earliest study of its kind, and I know a great deal about it because Caroline Bondé was my mother's older sister. She was my aunt. And um, my mother worked on this thesis and the book uh, during her college summers. It was a treasured fixture in my house as I was, uh, was growing up. And that's where I first saw the photograph of William Henry Hunt. Um, one reason it intrigued me was because he looked so much like members of my mother's, my father's maternal family and they too had the surname Hunt. My mother assured me that the, uh, the Hunts were not uh, related to, to, to Consul Hunt. 
Uh, I'd like to be able to tell you that I definitively learned otherwise in this book, but I didn't. Uh, I don't think we're related. What I learned is that um, Ida Gibbs Hunt and William Henry Hunt definitely did meet one of my relatives, a great uncle, in Paris in 1921. And, you know, this, this sort of expands our ideas of all the things that uh, African Americans did at that, uh, at that point. They had mutual friends in, in Washington and probably met again in the 1930s when Billy Hunt had retired from the State Department. Henry Hunt, a well-known educator, arrived here uh, in 1934 to serve as what was then called Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Black Cabinet. I don't know whether you know that term. Uh, of course, they weren't really cabinet members. The first cabinet member was a uh, real cabinet member, was Robert Weaver, who was appointed by Lyndon Johnson in 1965. But it was the first time that any sizable number of uh, African Americans held positions of substance in the federal government. I'd like to close my, uh, my formal presentation with a little of what Du Bois wrote posthumously about uh, Henry Alexander Hunt, which I include in the epilogue of Parallel Worlds. He asked rhetorically why, uh, why Hunt, my great uncle, had stayed so resolutely within the African American community, never taken the easier path and opted to become the white man that his physiognomy uh, declared him, when, as Du Bois wrote, thousands of men and women like him have done so. Those thousands who chose to pass for white included several members of the Hunt family I write about there and my Hunt family as, uh, as, as well. The overwhelming, and I'm continuing with Du Bois this, uh, opinion of white Americans is that one black ancestor in eight or 16 makes a tremendous difference of identity, of treatment, of opportunity. Uh, and then he went on to take a stand in America, however, as anything but a Negro would have made him extremely unhappy because here was an opportunity for battle on the highest plane. Life is primarily friends and family, uh, and one cannot lightly cast off this enveloping and intriguing bond of love and affection to create a new place in a strange world. So I've barely touched on 30 years of um, living, working, and adventuring around the world that's at the core of, uh, of, of this book about the remarkable Gibbs Hunts. But I hope that this discussion of mixed race families has given you a taste of what's in my book, uh, something to think about, something to chew over, and I hope that you will be stimulated to ask questions. We don't have terribly much time, but um, I would love it, and I thank you so much for your, your attentiveness. This is wonderful. Yes, sir. In, in your significant study of African American families, and I guess particularly uh, mixed uh, families, uh, how often did you come across the use of skin products, uh, skin lighteners or whiteners or even darkeners? You know, or was that something that you you were able to research? Or I mean, is that something that was talked about at all or uh, written about? Certainly, uh, I don't. I don't write about it because I never found it in any of the uh, any of the people <laughs> that I happen to write about. However, uh, I have. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, work with a woman who you you may know about, whose name is Alilia Bundles, whose um, whose great grandmother was Madame C. J. Walker, who developed uh, hair straightening. Uh, she called them hair health products skin health products that uh, also serve to create a more, a whiter appearance. But uh, I guess that one of the things is that it almost seems remarkable to me, not that so many people did these things, but that so many did not. Because uh, in, in our culture, there was so much of a premium that has been placed on, on whiteness. I mean. It, day-to-day -day inconveniences, legal uh, restrictions, and, and, everything, and, and everything else. You know, it's, uh, it is easy for me to understand why a number of black people wanted to be part of the majority in this country because they were so uh, discriminated against. So any steps in that direction, I think, were understandable. Thank you. Have 
enjoyed your presentation very much. Thank you. Uh, my friend and I came here from Georgia. We're both from um, the Deep South, rural Georgia, and wonder about your connection to Georgia given um, your earlier book, Ambiguous Lives, and just oh. wondered if you'd comment about that. Thank you. Um, I'm a big city girl. I'm a total northerner. I grew up in New York City, and I didn't know anything whatsoever about, um, about Georgia beside Atlanta. The, the world of the Deep South sort of began and ended for me with the Atlanta suburbs when I was growing up. And then in the 1980s, the early 1980s, I was um, also, I, I, sh I should add sort of on my own bio, that um, I, I went back to graduate school when my children were going to graduate school. So I was a very old graduate student. And so at, in case you all got confused about my age and my white hair. Um, but uh, so this was in, in the 1980s that I went, uh, that I went down to, to rural Georgia. And the ruralness of it uh, was a revelation to me. The, uh, the degree to which um, the South was still, much of the rural South was, not Atlanta, I mean, that's why the, one of the big differences, the rural South was still held captive by its, uh, its traditions of, uh, of, of segregation, but also how community and family retain uh, traditions that we, when we move to urban areas, when we move to the north, we sometimes lose these things. And I just totally became engrossed in this, in this family of mine that came out of, um, of Hancock County, Georgia, which at one time was the most populous county in the state and it is now just such a total sad uh, backwater. But there I found the most wonderful family and, uh, and friends. So that's a lot of my connection with, with Georgia. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, they're holding up a big sign in here that says overtime. I think they're gonna cut off my, uh, my mic anytime, any moment now. So let me once again thank you for, uh, for, for coming. And if I, can, if I can just add one quick thing, for some reason they scheduled my book signing before and not after my talk, which is crazy. But uh, if any of you do want, uh, want, uh, want book signed, I would, be, I would be more than delighted to do so. Thank you again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.